That makes sense to me. As you were saying it, I was kind of thinking like, yeah, like more tiling. And I know some other tasks I did last year with tiling, but even just at least like more repetition, just tiling and not with the necessarily trying to, to write a number model to go with it, like physically doing it. That makes sense. Cause I think that's probably where I'm missing it. If that kid couldn't go to the number model, even though they know that multiplication fact and they know that maybe like it's like the algorithm or if they were probably told it in another way they probably could in this math that. mentoring episode you'll meet bill zabazny del percio a grade three teacher from pittsburgh pennsylvania who always felt drawn to teaching but feels like he's struggling to squeeze as much mathematical thinking out of each task as possible having built familiarity and confidence in sparking curiosity through three-act math tasks and delivering other rich tasks that leverage the natural curiosity of his students, Bill is seeking support from the Math Moment Maker community to determine how he can best fuel sense-making on a daily basis. Listen in as we hash it out with Bill. Let's get to it. Welcome to the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. I'm Kyle Pierce from tapintoteenminds.com. And I'm John Orr from mrorr-isageek.com. We are two math teachers who, together, with you, the community of educators worldwide who want to build and deliver math lessons that spark engagement, fuel learning, and ignite teacher action. Welcome to episode number 23. They're engaged. Now what? A Math Mentoring Moment with Bill Zabosny Del Percio. Are you ready, John? Of course, of course. This is another Math Mentoring Moment episode where we will have a conversation with a member of the Making Math Moments That Matter community, like you, who is working through a challenge, and together we will brainstorm ideas and next steps to help overcome it. If you want to join us on the podcast for an upcoming Math Mentoring Moment episode where you too can share a big math class struggle, you can apply over at makemathmoments.com forward slash mentor. That is makemathmoments.com forward slash mentor. And be sure to stick around until the end of the episode where we will share some additional resources that can help anyone who's listening and feeling like they are struggling with some of the same challenges that Bill shares on this episode. You won't want to miss it. And now on to our conversation with Bill. Okay, Math Moment Makers, we are on the line with Bill Zabosny Del Percio, who is from Pittsburgh, and he's calling in tonight. How are you doing tonight, Bill? I'm doing pretty well. How about you guys? We are great. We are great. We are pumped. Yeah, yeah. We are just coming off a weekend there, and we are excited to chat with you tonight. So before we get going, do you mind telling us a little bit about yourself? We know where you're from. We know you're from Pittsburgh, but what's your story? Well... Started off, went to college for a couple of years uh, in the area, started with my education degree, got a little sidetracked, came back to it, you know, in my uh, mid to late 20s, and then just been on like a wild ride here, <laughs> you know, working around the Pittsburgh area. It's kind of hard to get a job around here sometimes, and I was lucky enough to land one without having to move and just really enjoying being in a classroom. I teach third grade, and it's more fun than I ever thought I could have at work, but also three times more challenging and harder than I ever thought it would be. So, you know, all those great things. Isn't that the truth? I definitely relate to that. And I uh, have to give my hats off to you teaching third grade. I have two third graders in my house right now. And I can just imagine what a classroom of third graders would look like. I'm a high school teacher. So <laughs> it's definitely daunting for me to think about teaching third grade. And maybe it's the same for you to think about high school, but hats off to you for sure. Oh, yeah. I mean, I love it. It's the perfect age. They can do enough on their own where you're not constantly being uh, interrupted or asked, but also at the same time, there's still a lot of just uh, natural curiosity and, and joy right. that they still have for learning. They haven't quite lost that yet. Yeah. You said it, the natural curiosity, like humans are curious beings, you know, and that's like that perfect age. My wife actually had spent most of her teaching career in grade three, just came off a couple years in kindergarten, which she enjoyed. Both of my children went through in the same school. She enjoyed, but she definitely had missed 
the like you had mentioned just that they have just enough independence they're still like all geeked out about learning you know they're not at the too cool stage like the grade sevens yeah so that's kind of her niche she's in grade two right now but i think hopefully one day she feels like she wants to hopefully get back to grade three so very cool oh, yeah that'd be great Awesome. So why did you want to become a teacher? Like what inspired you to kind of head down this path, especially when you're saying in Pittsburgh that jobs weren't necessarily super easy to come by a very similar story to us here in Windsor, Ontario over the past decade or so, you know, jobs uh, were kind of hard to come by. So what's your, I guess, passion that led you down that path? I just kind of always have been drawn to it. Every other job I've done, I've ended up being the person that had to train people or do things along that line or if I was part of a team, you know, always like teaching the other players how to do this or how to do that, you know, baseball, basketball or whatever it was. And it just kind of is a part of me. And one day I just decided to stop like fighting it. And I had a tremendous group of teachers coming from elementary all the way through high school. And, you know, I had a pretty special teacher in college and she was able to kind of get me back into it. We had kept in touch while I took the little break and she was like, were well, you coming back to finish this? And I was like, um, sure. And she's all right, be in my office tomorrow morning. And I was like, oh, okay. And then <laughs> basically <laughs> said like, you're doing this now, or you're never going to do it. So, you know, I had a couple of people uh, kind of give me a little kick in the butt to do it, but it was definitely always something I was kind of trending towards. I'm always like, I just had a student come back and say that I taught and that they were studying to become a math teacher. And, you know, I always think of taking that two ways. And it was the same way that I thought when I was becoming a math teacher, that one way is you take it as a compliment that they, you know, you think that you inspired them so much that they're also going to become a math teacher. But, you know, the other way, which is what my motivation was, was that I was going to do it differently. So (laughs) that student of mine said that I was like super pumped. Then in the back of my mind, I'm like, wait a minute wait a minute, are they uh, are they doing this because they want to change things? They want to do things differently than the way they were taught. So uh, yeah, uh, I definitely relate there. Yeah, that's, that's definitely a fear. I'm sure I'll have a couple come back like, no, nah, I can do it better than you. If they can, <laughs> and you know what? <laughs> Nowadays, I try my best to keep that open mind and say, you know what? I hope they do. I hope they come back and we want to keep getting better, right? So hopefully it's not in spite of what we're doing in our classroom, but hopefully just to keep pushing forward. So Awesome. Awesome. Bill, uh, there's a question that if you're a listener of this podcast or any listeners out there know this question is coming, but we definitely have to ask you, what is your most memorable math moment from math class? This could be as a teacher, but it also could be thinking back to you as a student in the classroom. Like what's popping into your mind as soon as we say math class? It was about my sophomore year sitting in geometry with a teacher and he was a tremendous personality an extremely brilliant guy, but it was like he was kind of speaking another language most of the time. And I just remember, like I'd heard the word before, but he was really trying to explain to us what a hypotenuse was. And that just kind of always sticks in my mind where it's like, you're just talking a whole nother language than what I was I was hearing at that time, what I could comprehend and, you know, just kind of like one of those little barriers to understanding. So I, that moment I keep in the back of my mind just as a Am I relating to my students and am I being overly complicated or am I using correct terms and explaining them? You know, it's so funny when it comes to language. And I heard a colleague of mine, a vet, a vet Lehman has said this a few times. I think it's quoted from maybe Lucy West about discourse in general, but also mathematical discourse and talking about in math class, like we have, you know, it's very similar to science where sometimes the language can sound so complex. And oftentimes it's just our approach to how we use the language and making sure that we do so appropriately because, you know, you've got kindergarten kids running around saying triceratops and that's not an issue for them, right? I mean, it's because they actually have a connection there. So I like how you have that awareness that you're always thinking, if I am introducing some complex language that students haven't been exposed to, you know, I've got to make sure that I sort of set the stage for that and make sure I use the language appropriately and often enough so that students can actually make those connections and actually start using it, you know, in their own daily language as well. Yeah, exactly. It's hard sometimes because you either fall off using the term that you need to be using or you interchange terms because, you know, as an adult, it's like whether you're talking about product or some, we'll often just say total and it's incorrect, but then they see product on a math quiz and they're looking at you like, I know you told me this, but you know, I'm like, oh yeah, it's because I haven't been using it. And 
Like, that's right, my fault, right. not your fault. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Being so intentional around our language is really important. That That's great. So we're wondering, Bill, what's on your mind lately? Like, as math teachers, John and I know very well, and we constantly have our own struggles and challenges going on. So we want to open the floor to you today. Uh, what sort of struggles or challenges seem to be on your mind lately and, you know, maybe we can get them out in the open and have a chat about it today. The biggest thing that's been on my mind, and I've been reading a bunch of blogs and a bunch of uh, email chains and things about, you guys call it sparking curiosity. And I feel like I kind of have that part. I've been doing three act tasks for a year now. They're kind of something when I was first introduced to them, I really was like, this is a great way for me to reach all the learners in my classroom and they can all achieve the same goal, but because there's kind of like that open middle, so many different paths to go to it, that whatever level they're on, hopefully I can take them to a more, I call it sophisticated way of doing it in my classroom. Like, hey, we're third graders now. Let's not just keep adding three together and skip counting. Let's try multiplication or at least, you know, chunking it a little bit. But once I get them kind of interested in a task, I find that I get a little bit lost in there somewhere with them. And I'm not sure if I'm kind of getting the most out of it. I tend to find myself either with like the high group trying to coach them up or with a low group sitting there in total confusion, trying to figure out like, okay, guys, we're exploring area here. Let's get out the tiles. We got the manipulatives. And I feel like, okay, while I'm doing that, everybody else is kind of gone. And I feel like I'm missing some opportunities there. I don't know if I'm not prepared for what they're going to bring, if I didn't anticipate it, or if I'm not picking appropriate tasks, if that makes sense. You know, I, you use the word sophisticated. I know oftentimes we hear the words like efficient and, you know, there's that desire in math to try to kind of push down that developmental continuum. And a word I really like, I hear Kathy Fosno use it quite often is she uses the word clever, like trying to get the kids to be more clever. It's kind of like a, a little bit like for me anyway, I've noticed a difference. Like when I say it, it's like, it seems less scary. It seems less, I don't know, forced for me because I used to try to work towards that efficiency. And, and what I realized over time was that oftentimes many kids were working at what I would call their most efficient method thus far, because that's where they were, but kind of pushing them to kind of, you know, put a little bit of thought in that metacognitive piece in there and, and really try to think of like, what's going on here? How could I do this a little bit easier? How is there a way that maybe I don't need to draw all of this out or I don't need to, you know, I could start, you know, moving from an array to an area model and that's going to save me a little time or, you know, whatever it might be, depending on the stage for the students. So very cool. Very cool. So you're kind of saying like, maybe they already are working at their, like, maybe that's a third option. I'm not thinking about that they might be working at their capacity at the moment. Yeah. Like it's definitely something to consider and, and not to suggest we want to keep them there. We definitely don't want that. But oftentimes like what I used to do and what I often say when I do live workshops is I used to take kids by the collar and I would drag them to where I wanted them to be. Now I wouldn't physically do this. Maybe back in the day you could, but not anymore. Not, <laughs> not here anyway. But I, I used to sort of take them and I'd be like, oh, you're doing, you know, I'd have some grade nine students who are not using multiplication. They were using repeated addition. And I was trying to get them to think multiplicatively. So I'd sort of be like, no, like, don't do it that way. Come on down here. And what a lot of Kathy Fosno's work has helped me to realize is that, you know, we want to help every student be a mathematician. Like they are mathematicians. We want to help them see through their solution strategy based on what they've selected. And we want to help them get to that next place, but without it being like us, like without it being us forcing it on them. Now, that's definitely difficult to do. So it's not something that, you know, you just get to decide tomorrow and everything's all hunky dory, but it really had me thinking more about like, what is the next step for this student? Like, I know where I want my class to be at, you know, we got this picture, we know our curriculum standards or, our, you know, common core standards or whatever standards we're using. And uh, I know that's where I want them to be, but that's by the end of a school year. And there's kids that are all over the map. And the reality is, is that 
for many kids, they might not be there today. And I've got to really think about like, what's that little nudge I can push them in the right direction? Yeah. And that's where I think I kind of get lost sometimes. You know, we just introduced that area and perimeter. And actually, after reading some things, I decided to introduce area before perimeter for the first time. Some of the things I read that seems to be a more, it's often confused. So I was like, all right, let's get secure in area because we've been using arrays. And it seemed like a more natural progression than my curriculum introducing perimeter after doing all these arrays and kind of muddying it. And I did a three-act test to try to like, I guess, get an idea to see how much they knew beforehand. And it was the one where you have to, you're painting the handball wall. And all my kids were able to get the, most of the kids, I guess should say, probably not all of them, but, you know, 16 out of 18 were able to grab the idea, hey, I need to find the area. I need to make this array. So they got that part of it, but then translating into the work over the last week or two, it's like, wait, area, you know, because I guess I don't know if the context's gone or, you know, they're not connecting that experience to the work now because like when it was a seven foot by 10 foot wall, I mean, my lower students were yelling 70 at me before I even finished. Your idea to bring up area before perimeter, actually, I'm doing a quick Google search because I feel like there's some research out there and I'll do my best to add it to the show notes after because I know I'm not going to be able to find it on the fly. But, you know, it's a conversation I was having with a few math teachers at a conference and it was just this idea that if we really think about measurement and we think about perimeter, we think about area, we think about volume. If you think of what you actually come into contact with in your life first, it would be like 3D objects, right? Like it's the world around you. And, you know, you think about volume from the perspective of a child in the bathtub who's, you know, dumping this container into that container. It's like, it's much more concrete. It's real. And, you know, next in line would probably be this idea of area. Like even that's kind of abstract. Like if I look at a, you know, I've got a Kleenex box on the table here. It's that time of year, you know, where the colds are going around and I'm looking at this Kleenex box and I can see rectangles on the sides of this Kleenex box. But what young children, they just see this Kleenex box, like they're not even tending to the fact that there's a bunch of different shapes that are making this Kleenex box. And then if you think about perimeter and just this idea of linear measure, like that's really abstract because for them, it's like measuring how long something is until they get to that non-standard of maybe using pencils to, you know, repeatedly iterate those pencils to count how many pencils long a room is or whatever it might be, or the desk. Like that seems a little bit more abstract than just sort of covering stuff like we would with area. So I think that's kind of a, a cool way for you to go and, you know, kind of build perimeter in when you kind of get to that place. Yeah, I guess after reading about it more, I thought about like, yes, like we do area more often than we measure linearly because they cover things or, you know, if they're playing with Legos or blocks, you know, like you said, the three-dimensional objects that seem to just make sense. Like, you know, you can look at that concretely and be like, yeah, there's some amount that this has to cover. But again, when I like kind of took that context away and we started doing some more procedural things, it was like, yo, I can find area, but I'm not connecting that. Right. Right. Yeah. It becomes almost like something separate than, you know, maybe the three act math task that you had initially used. Yeah. And that seems to be one of the issues is like, I can spark the curiosity. I can, you know, 50% of the time, I feel like it's very successful and the kids have like moved to a more, I like that clever way of doing things or have had their strategies reinforced or challenged. And then it's like back to, you can't just do those all the time. You got to work some fluency and some procedural skills, and then it's kind of disconnected. And it's a little frustrating sometimes because it's like, hey guys, you successfully did this on this thing I graded and emailed mom and dad and sent it home and you know, you're the prince of the world and now you can't do a couple problems. Yeah. So I'm wondering for this specific lesson, you know, going back to and I'm sorry, the three act math task you said it was finding the area of the uh which of a wall. I found it on some search for like three act area tasks and it was a wall that needed to be painted because it was going to be used for like handball or wall ball or you know, some game. And then it's like you had a can of paint and the paint covered a hundred square feet. Would you have enough to finish to, to paint the wall with one can? And, you know, the kids were, yes, you would. Yes, you would. Like so quickly, <laughs> you know, and I was like, okay, so you have very some cool. Yeah, no, I mean, it was great. And I was like, okay, so you have some idea of this, but now it seems like as we're moving through the rest of the unit, 
that real life experience isn't necessarily carrying over into like a slightly more abstract way. I love using manipulatives, but I'm like, all of you did this, not all of you, but like a good number of you did this with, uh, you know, like a number model or even just with mental math. They're like, I know how to find area that's 70, a hundred is more than 70. Yes. Like you got a real world answer quickly, but now as I'm trying to get you to like, okay, well, here's some shapes. What would be the area of this one or that one? Cause you know, we're going to have to take PSSAs in April and it's like, that's how they're going to ask them. You're not going to have, um, yeah, right. you're not going to have the context. Not that that's all that matters, but it matters. <laughs> no, I, but that's a challenge, right? Cause that's what you're up against. You know, we were talking with James Tanton a couple of weeks back and he mentioned that, that if that's the end goal, it makes it really challenging for us to kind of fill in those gaps. Like, so after you did the, how much paint for the handball wall, and actually I did a quick check and uh, it was uh, tasked by Robert Kaplinski. So we'll uh, definitely include that task in the show notes. But then what would be, I guess, like after that task, what was like the next, I guess, set of questions that you might challenge them to do? What did that look like, sound like, just to kind of paint us a bit of a picture? For, for just about everybody in the class, the next one was like, because the wall was freestanding. So it was like, could you do the front and the back? And they're like, no, we would need two cans. Some of the kids that were even more advanced, we looked up how wide a cinder block was. So they kind of cast like a three-dimensional net over it to figure it out. But then like the subsequent lessons were involving working towards like finding the area of rectangles and squares. And then if you had like a rectangle with like a extra rectangle sticking off of it to like non-traditional shapes working towards that. But I think because a lot of them, you know, it's the generic grid paper shapes that every square on this one, it's a square inch on the next one, it's a square yard, then a meter and not like a concrete object, you know, or like you're trying to figure out like, Hey, I need a rug that will cover this area and this area. Like what two size rugs would fit together to do that? You know, it seems that I feel like they would have a better chance of answering that than just like, Hey, like I got a square that's eight inches on each side, you know, well, I can tell you the area of it, but they're not really making a connection that that's the same as the wall. I don't think at least just from my probing and as going on with it, you know, I want to just maybe go back and think and just maybe make sure I grasp everything that you're struggling with here. It's you've stated you're using, you know, Robert Quincy's task and other tasks and three act tasks in your classroom, but you know, you're sparking that curiosity, but then, you know, something's lost in between and you're trying to balance. How do I keep good thinking happening in my classroom? When I move to getting practice in and getting that procedural fluency in and how do I transition from, you know, all this curiosity we've built up and engagement we've built up to making all these other things happen that we know has to happen so our kids can be strong and successful on future problems is does that sum up some of your struggles yes that is and this task maybe is i've had probably more success than other ones just because it, ultimately my goal is like hey can you find area and yes they can but as we're moving into more complex area questions it's not that they're going back to earlier strategies it's more that like they solve things one way when it was presented with context and now they're doing something different without the context you know, it, like the right. same number model. Oh, I did a number model. Mm -hmm. I was proficient with it or, or I tiled it with squares or something, you know, in squares. It, they've now moved to, they're doing something completely different that they had not done. It's kind of made the like pre-assessment like, oh, we have this. And now I'm like, wait, do we? You know, can we think more generally right now, like instead of this specific task, but let's think generally about many tasks that you've tried, like you do the task, you got all that curiosity built up. They're trying these strategies. What are the moves that you're doing next? Can you paint us that picture, like fill our listeners in on some of the moves that you're making in your classroom? Like, what does that look like for you now? And then we can hear that specifically. Uh, and then maybe we can make some suggestions. Like, what does it look like after you've you know, built all this curiosity up? up the kids are diving into the problem they're working they're and all of a sudden you know they've got some stuff to show you and even go back to as far as like how is that set up like are they in groups are they individual what does that look like for us so in general my students are always sitting at some kind of table or pod i really do not like anybody being completely alone i think they learn way more from seeing each other and trying each other's strategies and having a conversation than being isolated so right now we're in pods of three and there's 18 students in the class 
and they're roughly grouped by ability. I don't want to have a student who you know thinks completely differently and have another student who's just going to like piggyback on that. I want them to be with people who are all going to be working about the same pace as them. So they're each trying something. They could be doing different strategies, but I want them all working and not just sitting back and waiting for the smart kid at the table, quote unquote, to do something. And a little more specifically, and I'm thinking about this task, a student who has a lot of ability, this child went ahead and made a diagram of the wall, but then tried to use inch tiles to cover it, but it wasn't like to scale. So my move there was like, okay, now you said you drew a picture, now you're just filling it in with tiles. Is that, so it was seven feet high. I was like, well, are you going to try to make this seven feet tall or are you going to like try to represent it kind of like we just got off of graphs of like are you going to use like a scale or are you going to have like each block represents some number you know trying to kind of get her to to come up with the idea that this was going to be you weren't going to get 70 inch tiles on your paper because you're using you know a standard sheet of paper and you drew a very small square you wrote seven you wrote 10 and then you decided to tile it you know like there was no correlation between that With somewhat success, the child ended up not using the paper and just built the array. But this is a kid that's extremely fluent with their multiplication facts. And I was kind of wondering and puzzled why you didn't just multiply because everybody else in your group did. Like they immediately just were 70. Now they forgot it was a square unit, but that was, you know, that's a teachable moment. And we worked on that And, and she got there, but it just was really surprising in a way because my push was like, oh, okay, like you want to build it because you want to see it for some reason. I, you know, I guess you needed the concreteness of it, but you were not going to be successful with the first couple attempts because you missed the fact that you couldn't, like you wrote the number seven and number 10, but then you were just putting tiles over it and it wasn't going to work out. Right. Does that make sense? Because the scale was off, right? Yeah, the scale was off. I don't know how much they know about scale really other than on like a bar graph that you could, or a pictograph. I'm wondering, like, if we go back to the learning goal for that lesson, like, obviously, area is, like, very generally, that's kind of the learning goal. But, like, how deep into area, like, you've described, like, squares and rectangles, and you've even described that, you know, even potentially some composite shapes involving rectangular sort of pieces put together and that sort of thing. So, Like how involved does the standard go for, let's say for this specific lesson, like where are you hoping to get students to by the end of that lesson? By the end of that lesson, I wanted them to have a pretty solid, because it was like an introduction to area and to give them some reference points, a lot of context for like when and why they would want to use this to measure area, like painting a wall or putting rugs out, those types of things were, it was the context I wanted them to get. But as far as like my learning objective, I wanted to see how they were going about solving it. So I could then try to group like-minded thinkers and get some other ideas and then push towards, you know, more clever, sophisticated way of doing it. Hopefully most of the class could get to the point where they're using a number model or at least understand that. Because I do know one of the standards that we do have to get to is that multiplication using the area model. So it was like, we kind of did that. And I wanted them to relate that to area of plane shapes. We're not really responsible for three-dimensional shapes like volume, although like we do touch on it because it's just like, kind of like you said back at the beginning with the bathtub example, you know, they're aware of that and they know there's some way to measure liquid or, you know, gases, but I don't know if that clear enough, it makes sense. No, that makes a ton of sense. And so if this is kind of like an introductory sort of activity, I wonder if, you know, and while some students are going to get clever quite quickly, I'm wondering if like the next series of activities, like one of the challenges I see with this particular task could even be, I pulled it up on the web here to get a good understanding. You know, I see an image and for those who are listening, I'll try to help paint a picture, but you know, there's that handball wall as you described, and there's quite a few cinder block bricks that make this handball wall. But something, even though it seemed fairly obvious because the context was there that a lot of students actually ended up with 70 square feet right away, 
I'm wondering if they actually have that understanding, like if they just knew the algorithm, like they already, maybe someone had already told them like, you know, it's air, like length times width. So I see 10, I see seven, I multiply them. Like, I'm wondering if they actually were to have, and I know in real life, we can't go to this wall. It's, you know, who knows where it is, probably in California with Robert, <laughs> but you know, if they actually had like a square foot and like sheets of paper that were a square foot in area, because I'm curious as to whether maybe some students are kind of working on two different things here. Like, you know, this idea you'd referenced earlier that covering with tiles, it's almost like they're not seeing the connection between the covering of tiles and multiplying length times width, which makes me wonder if maybe having some activities in there where students are spending like a significant amount of time covering up different rectangles and squares with different unit squares as well. Like they could be non-standard, right? They could just be, you know, like this square is this square, you know, it doesn't have to actually, we could just call it a unit square, or it could actually be something physical from the classroom or whatever it might be. But just to give them that hands-on tangible experience to ensure that even some of our more, we'll call them clever thinkers, aren't actually kind of jumping the gun to the procedure and actually missing the conceptual underpinning that sort of underlying this pretty complex and really interesting area of mathematics. That makes sense to me. As you're saying it, I was kind of thinking like, yeah, like more tiling. And I know some other tasks I did last year with tiling, but even just at least like more repetition, just tiling and not with the necessarily trying to, to write a number model to go with it. Like physically doing it. That makes sense. Cause I think that's probably where I'm missing it. If that kid couldn't go to the number model, even though they know that multiplication fact, and they know that maybe like you said, like the algorithm, or if they were probably told it in another way, they probably could have got that, but they wanted to tile that square because they didn't have the next step yet. Right. And I'm even picturing like kids can get pretty clever even there. Like, even though like to, you know, Bill, you and John and I were thinking you know, like the tiling, like physically tiling seems so obvious to us. But in reality, for young children, oftentimes the things they do, they're completely oblivious to what's actually going on. And I had heard from someone somewhere discussing some research around like students early on, when you actually have them tile like a rectangle or a square, oftentimes kids won't even see the rows and columns until you explicitly call it out. Like they'll actually spiral it. They'll go around like the outside all the way to the middle or vice versa. And it's like, they're not even seeing it, but to you and I, it's so obvious. Like it's right there in front of us. And by doing that tiling, you might be able to get them to think cleverly and have them highlight by asking some of those questions like, how many rows do you have? And, you know, oh, I have four rows. Oh, and how many are in each row? And like really explicitly getting them to that connection that, wait a second, like if I have four rows of three, that's four groups of three. And I could also look at it as like three columns of four. Wait a second, if I multiply three times four, that's 12. And it's like that student generated algorithm starts to emerge, but it doesn't do so independently, right? Like it's always through like that questioning and those prompts and individual tasks that we really specifically pull out to really try to tease at that idea. Yeah. And the reverse would be true too, is that the kid who went right to multiplying, having them do the tiling backwards would be getting them to make that connection. Like you guys said about how the tiling is connected to the multiplying. Yeah. I think that's exactly what I was trying to get at and what I was looking for and where I kind of felt lost with like my teacher move, my next step, my questioning and what tasks I was going to do next. And it's making me kind of think like, hey, I want to maybe slow down and maybe spend a, another day or two or have a center, you know, when they're rotating through center time that like, this is something we need to do. Tile thing, even the same square with different objects. You know, I love that idea of giving them that opportunity through centers and, you know, and gradually moving towards the grid paper. And again, like for all three of us, like we're thinking we're adults and we've been on this planet for quite some time. And it seems so obvious to us that the grid paper is the next place to go. But to the student, again, making sure that they are seeing that like, oh, wait a second, we're using these grid paper to represent these tiles. 
oh, you know, like for many children, often it completely goes right over their head unless we really pull that in. We can let them explore it first. And I would always advocate for that is let them tinker and let them play and see what students come up with what. It's great when a student comes up with a connection and then they can kind of do the teaching. But at some point I've got to make sure I go, okay, so like we all see that, hey, look at this. This grid paper actually is the same size as this tile. And so now we're getting to that next little stage before we get to actually multiplying 10 times seven or whatever the dimensions might be. Because as soon as we get to those measured dimensions where we're starting to use numerals to represent a length and a numeral to represent a width, the tough part is it's so easy for us to know to multiply the numerals, but we aren't referencing the centimeters or for you folks, it'd be inches or feet or whatever it might be. That for students can so easily be missed because this idea of a number with a unit next to it is really abstract for them. They almost have to like paint that picture in their mind, you know? Yeah, exactly. That's really hard for them to remember to do it, to get to that place where you're like, there's something more than just a number. The number represents something. It's not just a number. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it's important, I think, to note here, and if you think generally that it's so important to plan out that progression of representations of where they start and where they're going to end. Like you have that kind of map in your mind or on paper as a teacher. And so that when you recognize where a student is, you're ready to move them to the next stage. And then also to move along the stage back and forth. Like if you're at the high end of the stage, like the high abstract, then can you move back to the concrete and vice versa? Like I think going forward, like it's so important to know that not just on this particular task, but all your tasks when you're doing three act tasks, it's what are we looking for? Like, what am I supposed to see come out of this task? Where do I want to go? And where do I want to end up eventually? It might not be today, but it might be down the road, but I definitely need to plan out where that is eventually for my grade level so that I can move that student along that pathway back and forth. And I think that can help a lot with knowing like what to do next. It's like I saw this stuff and it's all about knowing that one kid and what they've shown you in the past and what you can then say to them or what questions you can bring up, which are, you know, that's a really hard thing to do is what are the questions, what are the prompts that I can say to the student to bring them along the path? What are those tasks that I can throw in? Uh, but I think the pathway is is so important to know in advance where you're going to go. Yeah. So what I'm hearing then is maybe be, as I pick my task, try to be a little more intentional with how I anticipate or how I'm seeing the progression of that, you know, maybe from tiling all the way to the number model, but having like checkpoints along that continuum that I'm kind of looking to see or anticipating where a kid might be and a strategy then the how I want to move that kid up or down that as they're going. Exactly, exactly. So for example, like when I'm planning tasks, it's like we got to know where they are, like where they're coming from, like expectation wise, skill wise. I definitely want to know where we need to go. And when I pick a task, I write out like what are the possible solutions I'm going to see? Like I map them all out on a piece of paper. I possibly could see this from Joey because I've seen him do stuff like that before. Or I might see this solution here. I might see this solution here that's at a higher level. I definitely want to map those all out and be ready so that when I see them, I can then provide a suggestion to that student to move to the next stage on that progression. I and mean, you got to know, like, what is that learning goal that we're moving towards? Like that, I think that's a really important thing to say. Like for me, it's in that one block of math class. If I can get my students, majority of my students to that one learning goal, then, then I'm really happy with that. And moving to the, it might be, you know, it might not be just that one lesson. It might move into the next lesson. But I think knowing that learning goal is one of the most important things. And I think one of the challenges you have, Bill, is just the simple fact that with the younger we go, like when we're teaching younger and younger children, our challenge becomes so much more complex because they are at such a different level of development, like just cognitively that we have so much that we know just through experience and in just living every day we live on this earth you know and and when you think of how many lifetimes of grade 3 students we have you know for a 10 year old student i've lived three and a half of their lifetime and that is so hard for us to kind of unlearn 
what we already know to be true from the world around us, like just the very obvious things, you know, that we just know work. And for that, I definitely commend all our early years teachers, our primary teachers. So, you know, grade three is no exception because when you're heading into this idea of area, you know, something that I'm only recently been exposed to is this idea of approaching area from a counting perspective, like not even additive thinking yet, just counting. And that's that covering it up, that tiling that, you know, you've mentioned that uh, maybe you want to spend a little more time and do some centers with. And then eventually heading to this additive thinking, right, that I can start identifying, oh, wait a second, I've got three rows with four in them. And I could add four plus four plus four, you know, start doing the skip counting idea. And then we get into this multiplicative thinking, right? And like, that's like the early stages of proportional relationships and proportional reasoning. And it's really complex stuff that to you and I, it doesn't seem complex just because we just know it's length times width and we're good to go. But there's so much nuance there and, and there's no shame in us, in us, you know, having to kind of stop and reflect on that and go, huh, how am I going to do this? But if I can look at every stage that in my mind, I'm picturing my students starting here and ending over here. I've got my arms out in the space in front of me here. And if I can find ways to find a step in between those two every single time, and if I could then find a step in between those two and those two, and if I can just break it down further and further and further, and really just by thinking and thoughtful planning and and obviously collaborating, right? And that's what I think the power of these conversations on the podcast are is really just because three heads are are better than one and just getting to chat it out, I think is so important. So yeah, this has been an awesome conversation for me. I'm, I'm learning as we go. So thank you for that. Oh yeah. I mean, thank you guys. Like, I think that's the piece I was missing is that, you know, I was thinking about it abstractly as my lesson, like, okay, I'll see some do this, some do this, but not maybe getting down into minutia of how those things are connecting. Like how you just laid out, like, areas counting and then as adding or skip counting and then multiplication. And like, I knew what those looked like, but I wasn't thinking about how to move the kid from one to the next as much as just knowing that I wanted to take the kid that was tiling and counting and get them to try to skip count or add rows and not thinking about the tasks that they would need to do or, or what would be appropriate for them to do to get there. I guess. Right. And as we wrap up, we don't want to take too much of your time, Bill, but it sounds like you are starting to think about some of the takeaways from this conversation. But is there anything else, if you think specifically about our conversation here today, that uh, you could try in your classroom or what would be a big takeaway from this? It sounds like you're on that path already, but uh, anything else you'd like to add to that? Yeah, just I guess the next thing is I've made a note for myself here that I want to try to look for more um information on like learning progressions, you know, I know I have my standard and my eligible content and, you know, the thousands of resources that you have just from, you know, being in a district or whatever, but like trying to find progressions, I guess, for the next topics I have to teach, you know, like fractions, et cetera, et cetera. So that when I go into these tasks, you know, I have a little bit of guidance on how to move the kids up and down that progression. And also I like the idea of like taking the high kids and making them work backwards a little bit to make sure they really have that concrete understanding of it too, because, you know, it's real easy to say, Oh, you got it. And you know, well, if the kid's been tutored up or coached up on it, I miss their, you know, that hole in their knowledge. Yeah. So that sounds like a great plan. I'd actually be interested in also following along with that plan. Like I've learned a ton of this conversation. Like I said at the beginning, I'm a high school math teacher. So every time we start to talk about grade three math and all the nuances, like Kyle said about even this one main example we've talked about during this episode, it amazes me. And like we had on our previous episode, James Tan talking about like how every level of math has these deep intellectual moments and deep intellectual thinking that we can go in. And it's opened my eyes just to this conversation. So I'd like to thank you for that, Bill, bringing this to us and having this conversation. Uh, So yeah, we'd like to thank you for being here. Kelly, you want to do one more thanks? Yeah, one more thanks. And uh, also, if we're able to stay in touch with us over the next little while, but also uh, we'd love to have you back, you know, maybe six to 12 months from now and kind of see where you are in that journey and check up on uh, on your goal there to kind of look at some of the learning progressions and, you know, see where that learning's led to you. How does that sound? Oh, yeah, that sounds wonderful. I mean, I think that's uh, 
I'm online constantly stealing ideas from you guys and some of the other people, you know, with these three ass tasks that you put out there and those other ideas of uh, estimating an important math thing, I want to be able to give back a little bit. So if I do come across some good stuff, I'll make sure to send it your way. And yeah, definitely oh, beautiful. Definitely. We'll beautiful. stay in touch for sure. Awesome. Awesome. Well, on that note, Bill, we'll also put in the show notes a few task uh, links. So not only the handball task from Robert Kaplinsky, which is called, Do We Have Enough Paint? But also I was thinking as we were chatting here, and there's a few tasks that people might consider using in a similar scenario, like really trying to explicitly pull together this idea of area and arrays and multiplication. So a couple that come to mind is a cover it up task. So I'll include that link. Also the airplane problem. If you haven't tried that one out, that one is, it's not area, but you can approach it as area. And you'll see what I mean when you check out that link. And then if for folks who are working on double digit multiplication, so kind of moving up a little further, the donut delight task could be a good one for folks as well. So we'll make sure to put those all in the show notes. And hopefully this conversation is going to help more than just us and Bill, because I know, again, I always learn something new from these conversations. So uh, thank you again, Bill, for that. Yeah, Thank you, guys. This has been awesome. I got a lot to think about and I feel good knowing I have some things to work on, you know. Now I know, hey, let's try this. And some of that anxiety of what do I do has gone away. Awesome. Well, we're glad to help you there. Well, thank you, Bill. We hope you have a great night and uh, definitely stay in touch. We will be in touch soon. Sounds great. We want to thank Bill one more time for joining us and being so open and honest about his own classroom. Yeah, it takes a lot of courage to lower your guard and make yourself vulnerable. But in reality, this is a requirement if we want to continually improve. Kudos to Bill and all the other math moment makers who have joined us for these math mentoring moments episodes so far. This episode couldn't have come at a better time as our brand new Make Math Moments That Matter Academy is now open and we have a course that dives deeply into proportional reasoning and one of the modules focuses on measurement in particular as well as how we can work from direct comparison to indirect measurement which would be super helpful for Bill and others who are wondering how how to fuel sense making in this seemingly simple but very complex area of mathematics. Be sure to download the Why the Unit of Measure Matters guide to dive into one of the many very important ideas shared on this episode. And that is covered in depth in the proportional reasoning course inside the Making Math Moments Academy. Go to makemathmoments.com forward slash unit. That's makemathmoments.com forward slash unit to grab that guide. Not only does the proportional reasoning course dive into measurement, but we also unpack from comparison, through counting, through additive thinking, through multiplicative thinking, and finally onto proportional relationships, including clearing up the waters, the muddy, muddy waters of ratios and rates. If you wanna learn more about the ongoing year-round academy, head to makemathmoments.com forward slash academy. That's makemathmoments.com forward slash academy. We can't wait to dive into some deep learning with all of you. In order to ensure you don't miss out on new episodes as they come out each Monday morning, be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Also, if you're liking what you're hearing, please share the podcast with a colleague and help us reach a wider audience by leaving us a review on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, or whatever platform that you're listening on. Also, be sure to tweet us at Make Math Moments on Twitter and Instagram. Show notes and links to resources from this episode can be found at makemathmoments.com forward slash episode 23. Again, that's makemathmoments.com forward slash episode 23. You can also find Make Math Moments on all social media platforms and seek out our free private Facebook group, Math Moment Makers. K through 12. Don't miss our next episode where we will be bringing in the energetic, the fabulous, the wonderful, the queen of context in mathematics, Kathy Fosno. Well, until next time, I'm Kyle Pierce. And I'm John Orr. High fives for us. And high fives for you.